This is a real treat. I'm glad we could we could arrange this. I, I I'm sorry I, I couldn't be with you uh, in person, but thanks to the wonders of technology, we're virtually in the same in the same room. And I would like it, as Victoria said, uh, if we can be interactive. Um, uh, so after after my remarks, uh, I hope you'll find something uh, that either uh, interests you or angers you or, or, or piques your interest, and we can continue the discussion. Uh, let me begin by, by giving you just a sense of, of who I am and, and what my institution uh, uh, is because I, I think there are obvious differences but also uh, some similarities between, uh, between our, our institutions. Uh, and, and I think it just helps this, this whole process uh, if, we can, if we can focus initially uh, on, the, on the problems we share and, and the things that, that differentiate us. So I'm, as Victoria said, I'm a, uh, I'm a person who's, who's spent approximately equal times in academia, industry, uh, and, um, and government. Um, I, I, I left Hewlett Packard in 2002 uh, to come to Georgia Tech, a place where I, I, I went to school many years ago, uh, because I thought I could do something about uh, about education, and in fact, I arrived uh, uh, at Georgia Tech at almost exactly the same time uh, that the um, that the dot com uh, bust was hitting uh, was hitting us in the U.S. and and, and I think also in in Europe. Uh, and and my field is computer science, so it it, it hit computer science uh, especially hard. Uh, and and the the thing that focused my attention. Was that I was hired as a dean, so so I was I was handed uh, a set of problems that I didn't really uh, anticipate, uh, and having to work through those problems, uh, I had to rethink a lot of assumptions that I had about about higher education in the in the U.S. And I'm I'm going to get to some of those issues in a few minutes. Um, just a couple words about my institution: Georgia Institute of Technology is a public university. Uh, we're located in Atlanta, Georgia, sort of in the southeast uh, corner of the uh, of the U.S. Um, we are um, um, 140 years old, more uh, more or less. Uh, we're uh, I don't like to talk about rankings, but but just bear with me for a few seconds. We, we are uh, we are the seventh ranked public university. Uh, in the United States, we are mainly known for our engineering and compu computer science programs, uh, which are, are are ranked in the top four or five uh, annually by the by the the ranking uh, agencies. Um, that being said, we are we are a, a, a university, not a not a polytechnic, uh, and 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 we offer we offer degrees in the sciences, engineering, computer science, architecture, um, uh, humanities. Uh, and so, and so, I think there will be something in my remarks uh, that that overlap uh, your interest and in your and your background. But I, I think the the special focus that we have and the special mission that we have, which is in the technology area, is kind of a close match for your institution, which is which is very professionally based and very uh, and very very skill based. So, so I, I think there are a lot of things that I have to say this morning that will resonate um, with you. When I when I stepped down uh, as as dean uh, in two thousand nine two thousand eight, uh, I I I did what a lot of administrators do uh, when they leave their administrative positions. I I, I wrote a, a long memo to my president um, as sort of a valedictory. I wanted I wanted to describe uh, what our successes had been and what our um, what our our, um, our challenges uh, had been, and I, I wanted to lay out an agenda for the person I hoped would be the next dean. And as these kinds of things go, uh, I, 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 um, I wrote a five-page memo and, and showed it to some colleagues. And, and much to my surprise, I started getting questions back from my colleagues uh, about some things that I was saying about higher education uh, in the in the U.S. things things which which I had learned as an administrator, um, but um, were not widely shared or widely understood uh, among my faculty colleagues. 
uh, and I'm kind of a careful fellow, so, so I didn't want to send a five-page memo to the university president um, that, had, that had gaps in it. And so, so I started expanding this five-page uh, memo, and, and several months later, my five-page memo had grown into a hundred-page manuscript, um, which um, I had not anticipated. Uh, but, but that experience uh, of trying to explain um, the state of, of American higher education uh, in 2008 led directly to my first book, Abelard to, um, uh, to Apple. Uh, I'll come back and, and talk about uh, that book in a, in a second, but I, I have to tell you that, 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 that the, um, the title of that book uh, is just filled with meaning for me. So, so the Abelard uh, in, the, um, uh, in the, the title uh, refers to Peter Abelard, the, the 11th century French, uh, French monk who, who was arguably uh, the first true um, university professor. And, and, and the interesting part about that story for me is that, is that this was prior to the founding of the great European university. So here you had a pure teacher who, who wandered the countryside pretty much um, uh, empowering himself to gather crowds around him and, and, uh, and teach philosophy in, in his case. Uh, and, and the Apple in the title refers to Apple Computer. And in 2008, um, the, the largest online uh, repository of university courses was, was Apple's iTunes U, the sub store off, um, off Apple iTunes, uh, in which people could take for free um, uh, university university courses and and for me this was very meaningful that 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 you had this historical book ending of Peter Abelard a pure professor who taught the masses without uh, without the backing of an institution and and then you had Apple computer the 21st century uh, in my thinking 21st century version of, uh, of Peter Peter Abelard the subtitle of the book uh, is the fate of American colleges and universities. And if you read the reviews of that book, a lot of the reviewers seized on the word fate because it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pregnant term. It's a, it's a term that, that, that carries a lot of, um, a lot of weight. It, it, implies, it implies destiny. It implies, it implies a path forward uh, that, if you don't ignore it, uh, can lead you in unanticipated, unanticipated directions. And that was the view that I had of American higher education in 2008. I, I thought that it was seriously uh, uh, off track, uh, and, and Abelard to Apple tried to lay out what the issues were for American higher education uh, and present not necessarily solutions, but, but present alternative views of the way my institution and, and my peer institutions should, should go. Um, the, the book was, was successful uh, beyond my expectations, uh, and, so, and so when I started looking back um, three years ago at, at, at what we had accomplished, uh, I thought maybe a revision of the book should be in order because by 2012 there had been a substantial amount of change in, in, um, in American universities, and I wanted to document that. Uh, and, and as these things go, Writing a second edition of a book um, uh, turned out to be less interesting than writing a whole new book, uh, and so my current book, Revolution in Higher Education, I think is is the next step in this evolution from from fate. Institutions will 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 evolve according to economic and social principles to actually changing the way education is is done, and 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 that's the message that I want to talk with you about this morning. Um, it, it's clearly an American context that I'm, that I'm, I'm talking to you uh, from. So, so let, me, let me spell out just briefly what some of the differences are. Uh, because I, I firmly believe, and this has, been, this has been something that's been reinforced in my visits around the world the last few years, uh, I, I, I firmly believe that, that although my motivations come from an American context, the problems I'm talking about and, and the, the solutions to them are truly, truly global. This globalization of higher education 
uh, you don't have to look too far to see uh, its, um, its effects. The, the numbers of students um, that, that, um, that, that cross our, our borders um, uh, to study at, um, at foreign institutions uh, seems to grow inexorably uh, every year. The number of joint degree programs, the number of, uh, of, of joint research projects, uh, the number of ways that we find to cooperate on a global scale means that it's very, very hard for us to look at a single national situation in higher education uh, and ignore what's happening in the rest of the world. And I'll just give you one example of this. As we start to rely more and more uh, on, on regulators and accreditors uh, to help us judge the quality of institutions, you have to look at where those accreditors are, are drawing their inspiration. And they're increasingly drawing their inspiration from things like, like international league tables, which, which are, are very, um, uh, very self-consciously um, designed to measure institutions according to commonly understood, uh, understood benchmarks. And it doesn't really matter what part of the world you find yourself. I mean, you can be in a, in a, in a dusty village in the middle of Africa uh, and, and walk into a university classroom, which is crowded to be sure and, and, and not very well equipped, but yet somehow uh, a, familiar, a familiar place because, because the professors have been educated at institutions that we, all, uh, that we all know, and what happens in the classroom doesn't tend to vary much from, um, from place to, to place. So, so what are the differences? What, what, what is it that motivates me uh, that, that wouldn't necessarily resonate uh, with, uh, with you. Um, and I'll try, to, I'll try to just focus on, on a couple important, uh, important issues. The, the most obvious thing to me is that, that in the United States there's no Ministry of Education. Uh, and, and so what you have here uh, is a system of, of 4,500 um, uh, uh, independent institutions, each of them under the control of its own board uh, of, um, of trustees. It's a highly decentralized uh, system, especially compared to, to European um, systems in which, in which the ministry uh, controls, usually by law, something about the content of the institutions. That's very rare in the U.S. There is very little uh, centralized control of what happens at our, at our institutions. So, when you look at problems uh, that are endemic to, to the American system, uh, it's not simply enough to say, well, you know, the government can, can step in uh, and, and make a course correction. That almost never happens. There are very, very few instances in which the, the, um, uh, the national government steps in uh, to, to modify the course of, um, uh, of an inst institution. Um, I guess I guess another another difference uh, is that um, because of different histories, there's a strong sense of social contract associated with higher education uh, in the United States. Um, this stems from the middle of the 19th century when when a law was pa passed um, called the Land Grant uh, uh, Act, which which made a clean break between, between the history of American higher education, which was mainly modeled on, on British universities. American universities uh, in the 18, early 1800s were small, poor cousins of, of Oxford and Cambridge, more or less. Um, so this break was made to, to, to add um, what, what, what the U.S. Congress called um, a mechanical arts. Uh, to, to a traditional classical uh, education. Uh, and what they had in mind, clearly, was, was, was using universities to provide skills that a young and growing country would need. Everything from law to, to clergy to medicine uh, to, to engineering. Uh, and, and that focus on the career aspect of, of, a, of a university education turned out to be a historically deciding event um, in the United States. We are here, um, maybe more than, than, than any place I've, I've visited, focused on, on the value of a university degree as preparing a student for a future, 
a future career. Um, very much unlike uh, the classes that, that I taught in Italy, for, for example, where I would, I would be facing a class of, of 300 um, uh, engineering students, only a tiny fraction of whom intended to be engineers. They were in, in the engineering curriculum because it was of interest to them, not necessarily because there was some career, um, career tie-in. Um, I guess the, the, the final difference I want to mention, and, and this is the springboard for the rest of my, for the rest of my talk, uh, is, is the apparent contradiction between the success of the American system, uh, and um, I, I think if you if you look if you look at at any of the rankings of uh, of global universities, you'll notice a preponderance of, of North American uh, North American institutions. Um, so you have to contrast that with with the with the expense of of maintaining such a system, uh, and and for whatever reason. Um, Education in the U.S., particularly higher education in the U.S., has chosen the most expensive pathway. Uh, so, so, so we maintain uh, a system in which there are a number of elite universities, but, but the cost of doing that to the rest of the system is enormously large, uh, and, and some would say, I would say, uh, unsustainably, uh, unsustainably large. So, so you find, for example, extreme inequality. Uh, spread among American institutions. Among, among these 4,500 institutions, you find places like Harvard uh, and, um, and Stanford, which, which everyone would say are among the very best universities in the world. Um, but those universities enroll less than 20% of college students. Most universities are stuck in, in a, 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 an underfunded uh, model of having to deliver an increasingly expensive educational product with fewer and fewer um, resources. And, and, and this has been a driving factor for a lot of the change that you see happening, um, happening world, worldwide. Uh, a number of reasons for that, I'll, I'll get into them as we, as we go, go along. The, the, the thing that is always uppermost in, in my mind is that when you think of, of, of the Harvards and Stanfords in the US, you think of prestige. And, and in the American model, um, prestige is driven by exclusion. Uh, so, so, so these are institutions that have gotten to be um, uh, internationally recognized uh, because they have become more and more selective, uh, less and less connected to the people that were involved in the setting of the original social, uh, social contract. And, and, and that bothers a lot of us, especially those of us involved in, in public universities, that somehow this connection between what it means to be a quality institution can't be divorced from serving the people that are, are, are paying the bills uh, at, the, at the institution. So, so you will see in, in, in my new book, Revolution in Higher Education, a focus on what I think are the three most important aspects of, of that observation. Um, I've decided to focus um, uh, my work and the work of my center uh, on, on affordability. Um, that is the, the, the ability of the average citizen to be able to afford um, to attend even a public university. Um, uh, access, that is the ability of a person to actually interact with, with university level courses uh, and achievement. Uh, so, so, so why access, affordability, and achievement? Be because if you, if you just look at, at affordability and access, it's easy to imagine a path forward for higher education that, that is, is, is damaging to this, this social mission. Um, it, it, it's easy, for example, to take the thousand community colleges in the United States. So these are places that are two-year institutions. They're intended to be gateways to four-year uh, four universities. Um, you, can, you can reduce the cost of ed education at those institutions uh, simply by cutting back on the number of professors and enlarging the number of, of uh, enlarging the, the, the size of the, of the classrooms. 
that in anyone's view doesn't help students who want to achieve uh, achieve more. You have to you have to couple the 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 cost cutting that you might do to achieve affordability with something more structural. And and for me, structural change means not only not only doing something in a in a more um, in a more cost effective way, but actually doing it doing it better. And and I think that's that's the path that we've been um, that we've been on. So when I when I when I started to to do the research for um, for revolution in higher education, uh, I, I thought long and hard about the title of the of the book. I I, I understand that if you use the word revolution, uh, you can sometimes be interpreted as calling for for a revolution. Uh, and and to be honest, I, I was probably I was probably doing that, um, but but. The deeper message is is to recognize the changes that have taken place, uh, and to and to to recognize that we really have, uh, over the last five years, had a fundamental shift in how we deliver quality education in the in the U.S. and and it's a shift that's been driven um, paradoxically by these elite institutions uh, to make college more affordable, to make it more. Uh, more accessible, and at the same time, introduce the kind of structural change that actually makes education um, education better. So, uh, I, I I I sometimes get the question, what is it when you, you, when you're talking about affordability? What is it that you that you have in 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 mind? Uh, and and I, I recognize that for a lot of European uh, institutions. Um, the 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 cost to the student of attending college is is borne by by taxpayers, not by by individual individual families. That is definitely not the case uh, not the case here. Uh, there's there's a, a group at the University of Pennsylvania that publishes annually something called the College Affordability uh, Index. The College Affordability Index uh, looks at at the average cost state by state. Uh, of attending um, of attending college, and, and and just to show you how things have become uh, uh, not accessible to um, to a middle class family or a lower middle class family in the in the U.S., I, I just look at at one of our neighboring states, the state of Alabama, which is right next door to uh, to Georgia, where where I am. Um, in 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 two thousand eight. Um, uh, a middle class family in in Alabama would have to spend 90% of their disposable income to send a single child to a public institution in the state of Alabama. That's a public institution. That is the least expensive education uh, education route. When you look at, at at private universities, the costs are even more daunting. So so. Uh, in that same study, the College Affordability Index study, uh, in the state of New Hampshire, a small rural state in, in Northeast U.S., 170% uh, of family income in order to send a child to to a private um, a private institution. Those kinds of those those kinds of, um, uh, of of tears in the social fabric are not are not sustainable, and and they've driven a lot of what we're going to what we're going to talk about. So, many things to, to discuss in this in this area of themes uh, for um, for a, rev a revolution. Uh, I've mentioned affordability, access, uh, uh, and and achievement. Um, as I've visited dozens now a hundred campuses since since I started this um, this process, um, I hear some common discussions taking place uh, uh, in the U.S. Asia. And and in um, uh, in, in Europe, I, I hear, for example, um, very serious discussion about continuous innovation in education. Uh, it's it's easy to look at at research institutions, particularly Western research institutions, and and get the impression that all innovation is focused on um, uh, on, on economic development uh, and and research, and, and and that has been a shift over the last. Uh, seven or eight years, so so that you see uh, at at an institution like mine, for example, 
um, the Center for 21st Century Universities, squarely focused on establishing a culture of continuous innovation uh, in, in education, on equal footing with, with research, um, research innovation. And, and I'll, I'll share with you some of the results of that in a, in a, few, um, a few minutes. Uh, the future of work comes into the, uh, comes into the picture. So, so, so we tend to think in terms of, uh, of, of sets of skills that we're, uh, that we're imparting to, to our graduating students. But of course, those skills are only meaningful in the context of, of work that's going to be undertaken over the next generation. And, and every serious economist who's looked at the problem understands that the future of work has, uh, has shifted. Even something as, um, as seemingly cut and dried as computer programming, my field, uh, where, where there's, been, there's been an effort uh, uh, across the civilized world, I, I, I think, to, to increase the number of skilled people that have coding skills uh, entering, entering the, the, the workforce. Um, the nature of those skills is, is changing, particularly with the rapid introduction of artificial intelligence. What we think of as a computer programmer today may be an obsolete uh, uh, skill set 10 years uh, 10 years from now. Uh, so, so things like what is the changing nature uh, of, of work uh, very much weigh on our minds as we think about how to restructure our curricula and our, our institutions. Demographic shifts. Uh, you're, you're seeing with recent immigration uh, uh, dramatic demographic shifts. We in the U.S. are seeing dramatic demographic uh, uh, shifts. Uh, and it's not only ethnic um, that, we're, that we're talking about. Uh, when we when we look at uh, at the at the um, uh, at the average age of the of the American college student, we see that they are getting older. So it's no longer the case that a college in the United States can expect to see an 18-year-old secondary school graduate as a first-year student. Um, that age has gone up year after year. Now the majority of entering college students are outside of that key. Um, uh, demographic, and and so you have to look at at what's happening with 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 early education and and higher education as part of a continuum that's also uh, uh, undergoing undergoing shift. Um, I'm seeing I'm, I'm seeing an, an emphasis shift from from quantitative aspects of education uh, to things that are much more difficult to to quantify. So a lot of people. Uh, uh, including me, uh, have been, have been um, um, fairly insistent that we be able to quantify the quality of the education that we give our, uh, our students. And, and to be honest, there have been great steps forward in assessment uh, and assessment technologies that allow us uh, to do that. But as we make strides in affordability and access, what we find is that we are now making room in our curriculum to think about educating a whole person, not only a person that sits for an exam. Uh, and, so, and so you see a great emphasis now on, on a return to the humanities in, um, uh, in an institution like ours. You see, you see a great emphasis on looking for skills that, that are not testable on the day a student graduates, but are going to peak 10 years or more uh, uh, after after graduation, that is all new territory for for higher education, and and it, it's something that education researchers have yet to to grapple um, yet to grapple with. Despite the fact that we know that that so-called metacognitive skills, for example, are crucial to the success of students, we don't know how to measure those. We don't know how how to uh, how to organize classrooms to be successful. Uh, in teaching, in teaching those um, those skills. So, so what is this revolution that I'm that I'm talking about? So this this is a revolution uh, that that I think swept the world beginning in 2012 uh, with the kind of dramatic introduction of massive open online uh, online courses, and 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 that is probably um, the way in which you experienced uh, uh, changes on a on a global scale. Uh, uh, large numbers of students uh, taking courses for free, uh, generally not associated with an institution or not associated with a, um, with a, a degree, 
it was an occasion for a lot of hype. It was an occasion for a lot of media, uh, uh, media uh, coverage. Um, depending on where you were on the spectrum of, of people who hated the idea or loved the idea, it was either the savior uh, of, um, of higher education or it was the death uh, of, um, of a traditional um, university education. Um, we, did not, we did not undertake that battle. Uh, I think mainly because we don't have a school of education here at Georgia Tech, we decided that what we would do is, is undertake small projects to explore how this new technology uh, could, be, could be used. And I, I think the first surprise I had in this entire process was the number of my colleagues that were lined up outside my door volunteering to part participate. This is a pretty conservative institution that I teach in, like most engineering schools. The curricula has been around for a long time. Engineers don't necessarily like to change what they teach or how they, uh, or how they, they teach it. But motivated by some of the same concerns that I, I mentioned to you a few minutes ago, I found that, that when we announced that we were gonna start producing massive open online, uh, online courses, I had 50 colleagues. Um, the most respected colleagues at the institution uh, who wanted to try it out, who, who weren't quite sure what this new technology was going to, uh, was going to mean, uh, but they knew it was something different than what they had seen, uh, seen before. The story I heard over and over again from my colleagues was that, that they looked at the first wave of, of, of MOOCs, Massive Open on Online Courses, uh, and saw quality classes uh, being taught by, by the best people in the world to 150,000 students. And, and, and every one of us who looked at those numbers kind of sat back in our chair and said, huh, I hadn't expected to see that. I wonder what that, I wonder what that, that means. Um, we, we, um, we obtained private funding uh, to explore this, this area. To date, uh, we have a portfolio uh, of of courses that attracts over a million and a half students um, around the world. Um, like a lot of experimenters in this space, we didn't really anticipate that we would be doing degree programs or four credit offerings using this, this format. Um, it was my successor as the Dean of the College of Computing here at Georgia Tech who said, I wonder if we can do a degree program uh, for, um, uh, for larger numbers of students using this same technology. Uh, and uh, and that, was, that was the start of a discussion that led to Georgia Tech's online master's in computer science. This is a master's degree in computer science. It's, it's one of the, one of the, the, the very well-respected master's programs in the world. Uh, and and, and the dean decided that, that what we would do is, is try to offer this course in massive open online format, using the kind of pedagogy, using the kind of, of, of data-driven educational research that we had developed in offering our other courses. Um, we all had different motivations in, in pursuing this, uh, this strategy. I, for example, thought that, that what we were doing was, was mounting a highly competitive offering uh, that would advantage us when compared to our peer institutions. I thought, for example, that we would be successful, but the way that we would be successful would be to, to essentially steal students from, from the highly ranked programs near us at North Carolina uh, and, uh, and Vanderbilt and, and Virginia. Uh, and, and so, um, Everyone who was involved in developing this program had his or her own set of motivations for how it was going to, going to work. We launched the program uh, in 2013, uh, and the business plan for this program showed us uh, uh, peaking out at about 10,000 students after, um, after five years. Now, now, here's the thing that's, that's critical to understand about the online masters in computer science. A student coming to the Georgia Tech campus to take this degree 
pays about forty-five thousand dollars for the for the degree. Um, the online version of the degree, which is course for course, exam for exam, instructor for instructor, uh, the same program that's offered to residential students, um, costs the students six thousand seven hundred dollars. Um, so, so it's somewhere between a five and seven fold uh, 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 cost improvement to the um, to the student. From the day that we announced the program, uh, we realized that our estimates for the numbers of students that would be attracted to this were 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 low by an order of magnitude. Uh, it took us it took us two years uh, to build that program to four thousand students. Um, we're well on our way to, um, uh, to 10,000 students. Here's the interesting part of this story. Uh, those of us who thought that we were going to be stealing students from other programs were completely wrong. Uh, this was, unbeknownst to us, not only ex an experiment in affordability and achievement, it was an experiment in access. Uh, because the students that were attracted to this program came from regions of the country where the nearest master's program in computer science uh, was, was a day's drive away. So one of the places where we drew the most students turned out to be Central California. Um, Central California, California is, is rich with, with public universities. You would think that engineers working in the IT industry in Central California would have lots of options. But in fact, if you're getting a master's degree, uh, you're not an 18-year-old student just starting out in the world, you chances are have a family and, 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 you, and, you, uh, and you have a job and you can't just pick up stakes and, and move for two years um, from, um, from, um, uh, from Sacramento, California to Berkeley to complete your, your degree. So those were the students that we, that we attracted. Um, and there's a recent study um, that has just come out of uh, Harvard University's Kennedy School uh, that looks at the extent to which this program has expanded access to graduate education in computer science. So in its first year of operation, uh, the online masters in computer science has expanded the market for graduate education by 8%. One program, one year. Um, and if you project that over 10 years, this program will have doubled the market for, for master's degrees in, in computer science. That was done by a mix of, of, of applying quantitative education research technology in a clever, uh, in a clever way and, and, and enforcing quality in the, program, in the program itself. Now, how does this affect affordability? Uh, to the student, it sounds more affordable. $6,700 is a lot cheaper than $45,000. Um, the 4,000 students that we've added to Georgia Tech have been added with a zero net increase in faculty. Um, so, 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 so we have, just by offering this program, improved faculty productivity um, substantially as a, as a result. And, and you can see the effects of this rippling through our campus and other, uh, other campuses. Uh, I think it's, it's not beyond the realm of possibility that every one of our professional master's degrees uh, will be offered in this, in this format. Um, if you read the online comments for the, for the student, from the students, they're happy with the program. We measure the results uh, of these courses so we know how students are achieving relative to the residential uh, experience and, and, and the results are um, results are, are dramatic. This has also been the occasion for us to continue this innovation process that we've, um, that we've talked about. So, so how, do you, how do you take a cohort of 4,000 students and without increasing uh, your, your faculty workload, do simple things like grading homework or grading, um, grading exams? Um, we've started a broad-based research program uh, on how to use peer evaluation uh, to to do that, and and you know this is not simply exchanging homework um, between uh, between classmates. This is a carefully designed process in which we know what the meaning uh, of a peer grade is that that's assigned 
uh, on, a, on a piece of lab work, for example. And, and as, you, as you look at, at, at the ways in which the results of these courses have been used both in the residential part of our program and our online program, you can see the number of innovators flooding into our laboratories and, and to, develop new, um, to develop new courses. Um, so let me bring this part of our discussion to, to something of a, of a close here. Uh, I, I think if I, had, if I had tried to project in 2008 where the course of this revolution would have taken us, I would have been completely wrong. Uh, I, I think what we're talking about is not a technology revolution. Uh, it's, not, it's not a, uh, a revolution that involves cost cutting and cost savings. It really is something much more, much more structural. Uh, when, when we started out, uh, I, would, I would try to short circuit discussions uh, about, about cost, because it's, it's easy to think about cost as just cutting costs. I would try to short circuit discussions about cost by, say, by, by saying it's not only about cost, it's about, it's about quality. So, so it's not fair, uh, for example, to simply set a goal of cutting the cost of offering a degree by 50%. Um, what is fair, because that's easy to achieve, what, it, what is fair is to ask what kinds of structural changes would you have to make uh, in order to improve the quality of your offerings uh, by 120% at 80% of the cost. Uh, and, and, and those figures turn out to be very interesting touch points for us. You have to change things. You have to change the way that you, that you look at, um, uh, at education. One of the, I think, dramatic consequences of, of what's been done uh, uh, at, at, at my place and, and a lot of peer institutions uh, is, that, is that you see for the first time the effectiveness of the lecture format on the college campus really being called into question. Um, and in retrospect, it probably shouldn't be that surprising. Uh, if, you, if you take a bunch of young people, and I, I, see, I see you're in a very nice auditorium, but, but, but you know, when there's a lecturer at the front of the room and the, and the lights go down, I can, I can almost visualize the naps that are being taken place in the back of the, back of the room. Uh, we see the same thing, same thing here, that, that giving a speech uh, to, to uh, an audience of passive students um, satisfies none of the requirements for effective learning. And in, and in fact, if you look at the neuroscience of learning, um, you can understand very quickly that, that the idea of lecturing to students and then testing them at some later, some later point has no basis in science at all. Um, it's not how the human brain learns. The human brain learns by, by being stimulated in short bursts. Attention is redirected, dopamine is produced. Neural transmitters sense the dopamine and, and there's a reinforcement cycle that, that causes memory to flow from short-term memory to long-term memory. We don't exactly know how to do that. It would be great if we could have a pill that would, that would, uh, that would stimulate that effect. But what we do know is that the long form lecture, the thing that we've inherited from Peter Abelard, um, works against that. It simply is not compatible with the way that people, that people learn. Uh, and, and all of the psychological studies that have been done in the last 50 years verify that. We didn't quite know how to interpret those results. For example, when Benjamin Bloom's uh, classic paper called the Two Sigma Problem uh, noted that 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 you can take any classroom of students of any skill level that you want in any subject anywhere in the world, uh, and and if you simply move from that 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 passive learning lecture format to something more active, uh, a kind of pedagogy that he called mastery learning, you can move everyone in the class to the 80th percentile. That is, you can, take, you can take the mean from that traditional classroom and move it a standard deviation. And in fact, if you add, in addition to mastery learning, one-on-one -on -one tutoring, that is one-on-one -on -one attention, you can move them to the 98th percentile. You move them another standard 
um, standard deviation. Um, why, if this has been known for 50 years, have universities and other schools continued along the lines of offering a style of education that was so demonstrably inferior? Well, there's, there's a, a sentence at the end of Benjamin Bloom's paper uh, that is very poignant. It's, it says that although, although this, is, this is obviously the, the better way to organize a classroom, no society can afford to do it. Um, one of the things that we get out of technology uh, is the ability to now organize classrooms in, in this way. And so as you look at the changes sweeping through higher education here, in Asia, to some extent, in, in Europe, this is the kind of thing that you're, that you're seeing. It's, it's not that we've discovered a silver bullet, which all of a sudden makes us superb teachers and students superb, superb learners. We've, we've learned um, uh, to, um, uh, to wash our hands before surgery, if you understand this, th this metaphor. We, we've learned the things that are harmful to education and the ways in which technology can in intervene uh, and make it um, and make it better. So, so when I when I talk about when I talk about revolution, although it's 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 fun to talk about individuals and 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 um, and, and people storming uh, storming the gates, and, and and we just are going through a presidential election cycle here uh, in the U.S. where one of the candidates has been calling for political revolution. It's, it's fun to think about revolution in that sense. I'm actually thinking about revolution in a slightly different. Uh, different sense. I'm, I'm thinking about the kind of revolution that takes place when when old paradigms shift, um, when when you start to establish new vocabularies for thinking about what you um, um, what you do, uh, and and I, I keep coming back to a phrase um, that that um, that I first heard from Buckminster Fuller. Um, so so Fuller was this uh, incredibly influential. Uh, figure in uh, in American intellectual life for most of the 20th uh, 20th century, and and one of the things that he had thought deeply about was what, what, what was how you change the course of large enterprises, how you change the course of large uh, of large institutions, and and for him this was always about how you engineer change in organizations, and. It sounds obvious, but 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 it was it was his his crowning insight, I believe, um, that you don't uh, change the existing reality by fighting it. What you do is you provide an alternative that makes the old way of doing things obsolete, and so that's the kind of revolution um, that I'm that I'm I'm talking about. I'm absolutely convinced that 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 in the United States and around the world. Uh, uh, institutions will divide into two groups. They will they will divide into 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 those that recognize that the old way of doing things has become obsolete, and we can do things in a better um, uh, in a better way, a more responsive way, a more responsible way. And those institutions that cling to the old models, um, which are frankly speaking not sustainable, uh, and will disappear. And those institutions will will disappear. Um, so I, you know, I, I fully intend to, to, to you know, come back uh, four or five years from now with a, with, with a look at, at how these kinds of changes have affected our institutions, what kinds of new educational models uh, are we able to introduce as a result. Uh, but I can see already the pathway is clear that, that, that if we look out even four years or five years, um, that we will be educating students uh, not in, in in theaters like the ones that we find ourselves in in today, but in much different spaces, using much different uh, kinds of technologies, expecting much different things from our students. So I, that, uh, that thank you for your your attention. That that's probably a good point. I think to Victoria, open us up for uh, for questions if we have any. I'm Laura Ziska. Hello, Dr. Demilo. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, I'm Laura Ziska. I teach academic writing and business communications, if that's important. Um, we know that there's a gap for the STEM students, for example, between their expectations in higher education and then their first jobs. And you mentioned the humanities and the return back to humanities. So my question is actually twofold. The first one is, what do you believe are the most important skills that today's students need and will need within the next 10 years. 
And secondly, what are your thoughts on bridging the gap between the expectations of these millennials and the teaching and learning environment? Right. So, so those are two. Those are, are two critical critical questions. Um, and and the, the the skills question, as I alluded to in the talk, I, I think is is a very interesting one. It, it's it's easy for us, I, I think, to try to make skills inventories, and 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 teach to those to those inventories. Um, what we found is that that um, uh, that misses the larger question of of, of what happens. Uh, once those skills are are acquired, so so we would like our engineers, for for example, uh, uh, to have to have basic engineering knowledge, the ability to do basic uh, engineering engineering calculations. Um, what we also need are are people that can not only solve problems but identify problems. That that takes a different kind of education. That takes a much more liberal uh, education. I'm I'm something of an odd person in engineering because my undergraduate experience is in is in liberal arts, uh, so I, I I came to technology and engineering as a graduate student, not as an undergraduate, uh, and and I I know that 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 the broad world view uh, uh, is important in order to to make progress uh, in the in the world. So so we've I think to the detriment of students taken the liberal part of education and tried to make a skills-based educational model um, uh, out of it. Uh, it's not exactly clear what the, what the right model uh, is, except that the places that seem to integrate um, uh, humanities, liberal arts, uh, liberal thinking uh, into, into skills-based education tend to do better uh, over time. So not only do the students end up being placed better after they graduate, that if you check back 5, 10, 20, 30 years after graduation, those students have, have, um, uh, have benefited from that, from that education. We, we see this at, at our institution um, a, a lot. And it, it, when I said that it's not quantifiable, this is one of the things that I, I, I had in mind. A, a Georgia Tech education uh, is, um, uh, is, is known by our students to be a very competitive environment. Uh, so, so students find themselves competing with each other uh, almost from the day that they hit, hit campus. Um, they develop a sort of toughness about them that when they leave us and take their first engineering jobs, serves them well. And, 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 and we know because we have 100 years of history to track that the students who come out of this environment tend to do well over the course of their, uh, of their, their careers. Uh, those in, in, in the modern, in the modern um, uh, language of education turn out to be 21st century skills. Uh, so, so the ability to communicate, the ability to effectively work in groups, the, the ability to be able to push your ideas effectively in large, large organizations <clears throat> are essential for engineers. You can't learn that in a calculus class, and you can't learn that uh, in, an, in an engineering class. It has to be integrated into every aspect of, 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 of your life. And we're just learning how to how to do that. I can give you one instance uh, where, where we think we've, we've seen some, some progress. Um, there is, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what it's, what it's called in, 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 in Europe, but the, the, the movement in the U.S. is called the maker movement. Um, and, 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 and what it is, is, is simply providing space and tools and, uh, and materials uh, for students to, independent of their curriculum, create. Uh, and in, in the case of our students, these are technological creations. It can be 3D printing, it can be uh, creating new electronic objects, it can be playing around with, uh, with, with, with robots. In other disciplines it will be, it will be, uh, it will be writing, it will be the, the creative, uh, creative arts, uh, it, 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 it may be performing arts, it depends on the kinds of institutions. But, but the institutions that recognize that, I think, and think through what do we need to do in addition to our curriculum? Uh, in order to provide students the space to acquire those skills. We can't teach those skills, they have to acquire it. Um, those institutions will be positioned better, um, better for, for success. And, and because of the industry that we're in, we're probably not going to get a cookie cutter approach. We're not going to get a single approach to those, um, to those problems. Given the nature of your mission and the nature of your, of your curriculum, you know, I can imagine creative spaces, maker spaces for you that are very different 
than what you would see at an engineering institution, but you still need to make room for them in the, in the curriculum. Now, the other side of that equation is you have to make room for them. You can't, you can't have a curriculum that's so filled with basic material that, um, that, that there's no time to, for these, these kind of undirected uh, explorations. And that's where MOOCs, that's where technology uh, comes into play. So, so you get much more efficient at, at, at teaching the material that, can be, that can, be, can be taught in a more structured, technologically informed way, leaving professors free to do what professors do best, which is interact with, with students. Uh, the, the, gap, the gap from, from, um, from university to, to the first job, uh, I think, is just a burden that we're always going to carry with us. Um, I've been doing this for a long time. Um, when I was in industry, I was never happy with the result of, of, um, of the universities that supplied us our students. Um, and, and now that I'm on the academic side, I see that no industry is totally happy with the, with the quality of the product that we, um, that we produce. I, I, th I think for not very noble motives, uh, it, it's, it's, it's easier to, to use the university's resources to train your employees than to provide training of your, of your own. But, but this first problem that I mentioned, which is providing unstructured space, co-curricular space, space that's separate and apart from the formal part of your curriculum, I think is going to be a necessary building block for all of us. Hello, uh, my name is Markus Birkenkrai. I'm a guest here from the Berlin School of Economics and Law. And um, I was intrigued when you said that you had uh, people beating down your door to develop MOOCs. Now, it's a, just a very practical question. What skills do these professors who develop online courses uh, of this order of magnitude, what skills do they need and how do you train them? Well, it's, it's, a great, it's a great question, and, and the fact of the matter is that the people that were lined up outside my door probably had no idea what they were getting into. Uh, and and um, uh, the, the, the things that we asked them to do uh, in, in the online courses was very much unlike what happened in, in their traditional classroom. Uh, and we noticed early on, for, for example, that, that professors just wanted to point a camera at the front of the classroom and record a lecture, uh, and and we knew that that kind of pedagogy wasn't going to wasn't going to work. So so we provided a team um, uh, that would interact with the, with the professors, um, much like you would see in a medical situation, for example, a lead surgeon and a and a, and a group of 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 team members uh, around him or her. Um, so. Instructional design turns out to be a very important aspect uh, of this. That's very different than than looking at 13 weeks of of, of three hours of lecture per per week because you're now producing small snippets of, of content, 10 minute at most lectures videotaped, followed by an assessment, followed by some some. Uh, uh, adaptive learning model that allows students to choose different paths through it. That doesn't happen by accident. Uh, and, so, and so the process of learning how to do that, I think, was, was the first step in, in having seasoned professors, really good teachers in the old model, um, realizing that there were new techniques that they could carry back into their, um, into their, their classroom. Um, I, I would like to report that it was 100% successful. Of course, it wasn't, uh, and 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 we had we had teachers that would just walk away and say, "Well, I, I don't see why I should change my methods uh, uh, at all." But a surprising number, especially for an engineering institution, a surprising number uh, of our of our faculty uh, saw the results in in the online version of their courses and immediately pivoted their teaching style in the traditional classroom to match what they were doing, um, doing online. It was one of the big benefits that we had of our investment in, in, in online courses, the effect that it had on the residential experience for our students. Thank you. Hello? So, uh, Hilary Murphy, um, I would ask you, um, who's going to be the big disruptive force in education? We know that uh, the likes of Apple and Google 
they must see education and the thousands that people spend in education is just ripe for plucking. Uh, are we going to be left behind? Do they want to partner with us who we think we know about pedagogy and learning and teaching? And a second question, uh, really, we've spent millions on buildings. What's going to happen to all these buildings yeah. that... Uh, you know, these are assets that we have as institutions that are endowed. What's, what's, how are we going to make money from them when we've invested so much? Well, let me... Say physical construction. So, so let me, let me uh, attack that last question first because, because it, is, it is a real issue um, for us. When, when, um, when, when my president um, decided that, that he was going to support the Center for 21st Century Universities and, and support... The, um, the production of, of MOOCs. Um, we made a presentation to our board of trustees, what we call our, our, our board of, of, of regents. Uh, and, um, and, and Dr. Peterson said something that was just startling to the group. He said, I, I, I don't know why we would ever approve a traditional classroom building from this point, um, from this point on. This, this is from a president who's made his career raising funds to, to, to build theater style seating um, to give lectures to, uh, to students. But he was, he was right um, that, that we have to rethink our capital uh, investment. Um, you know, a lot of the assets that we have, capital assets that we have, are going to be stranded. Uh, we have to think very hard about what to do with them. Um, the building that, that I'm in right now is a, is a building that I helped build uh, uh, six years ago. The, um, the bulk of the of the classroom space in this building uh, looks very much like what I see in the background there, uh, and and it, it's becoming increasingly unusable. Uh, what 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 students are looking for is flexible space. The cl the classes that I teach, I should be teaching them in theater style seating. I have flexible seating in my in my center, and so so I literally pull the students out of the traditional classroom. Into into something that's much more collaborative and, and reconfigurable, uh, and and it works well for my classes. It works well for the classes that that use that um, that use that space. So I, I think we're going to have to take a look at the tremendous capital investment that we have, and decide what to what to do with it. Um, maybe some of us will open museums that we can we can say here's how we used to teach um, way back way back when. Uh, and I'm sorry, the first question was. Um, the disruptive forces. I so mean, the, the disruptive the forces, yes. Right, disruption. Yeah, so... Uh, so we think with the, the, the accreditation for courses, do people really worry about that in the future? Wouldn't they rather have an Apple degree or a, a Google degree or a, a Microsoft uh, degree rather than a bachelor or a master's? Or it's, one, of, it's one of the battles to be, to be, to be fought. Uh, I, I don't think so. I, 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 I think that, that, that we all spend... Uh, decades building our brands for 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 our our degrees, um, and the experience is is that is that the, the the marketplace values those degrees. It's the only thing that we know the marketplace will spend money uh, uh, on. Uh, and although there are external disruptive forces uh, that 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 we're that we're adopting, they haven't really disrupted the value chain. Um, involving degrees, so we, we may have different kinds of degrees. We we may we may have different ways of uh, of packaging um, our our diplomas, um, but it's it's hard to imagine that um, that that a Google or or, or a Microsoft uh, is is going to be able to establish that brand over um, uh, over time. If, if if you think about the stable brands uh, that would be good candidates, these are companies that are less than fifty years old. Um, and there's no guarantee that they're going to be around in the um, in the future. So, so we partner uh, with uh, with a lot of external companies. We, um, we we think that 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 there's a lot that we can learn um, from their their technology. Uh, but I'm one of these people that is not convinced uh, that 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 they are going to be a replacement for a university university education. Uh, we, we we've got a, a a long history here, and and you have a long history with polytechnics. Uh, in, in Europe of producing um, uh, uh, graduates with a certain level of skill and a certain kind of certification that is meaningful in the, um, in the marketplace. Uh, maybe some of that gets readjusted in the, in the process, 
Um, but when you step back and look at the larger uh, economic picture for, for higher education, the, 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 the flow from, from, uh, from students recognizing a need for education to some credential uh, that has weight behind it, uh, I think is going to, um, is going to remain. Um, you, you mentioned the accreditors, and, and, and I'm, I'm a very vocal critic of the, uh, of the accreditors. I, I think the accreditors have not done a good job uh, of, um, of setting a bar uh, a quality bar for, for higher education. They've become involved in, in defining league tables and, and, and trying to measure, uh, uh, measure quality and, and, and induce us all to, to improve quality when they don't really understand what that, what that is. So, so to the extent that, that there's a regulatory function that is going to take a dispassionate look at all of these various players and, and establish rules that we can all play by, I think we'll be better off. But that being said, that, that being said, the, um, the, the, the experience that we have here is that, is that a university brand is extremely hard to displace. Uh, and, and, and no matter what the market presence of a disruptor is, it doesn't really have much meaning um, when it translates into, into the, the university degree. You know, we've, we've begun to graduate the first set of cohorts from our online masters. There's no reason that these students would ever have to visit the Georgia Tech campus, and yet they show up on graduation day to be able to walk across the stage and receive their diploma from the, from the president. Why is that? They feel an emotional tie to this institution that they've only visited virtually. Uh, and and that's, a unique, that's a unique thing among, uh, among universities. It's hard to imagine that being displaced easily. And, and so I, I guess I'm... I'm I'm willing to be convinced by contrary evidence, but I haven't seen very much in the way of market changes that would convince me that there's much change coming. Catherine LeCain, um, I just have a question around, um, your, you made a quote early on around prestige is linked to exclusion. And when we talk about MOOCs and the availability to five and 10,000 people, do you think it impacts the appeal of a particular course if it's widely available? I, mean, I think it's a complicated, complicated question, and I, I, I don't pretend to know the answer to it. I, I, can, I can tell you that, that from the data that we've been able to uncover, um, students experience these courses in different ways depending on what their expectations are. So if you, if you look at one of, the, one of the courses in our online master's degree, for example, there are, are really four kinds of students uh, in, those, in those courses. There's, there's the typical MOOC student who is just browsing and, and comes across this course and, and may sit through a portion of it. Maybe they, they just want to learn this little bit of machine learning or this little bit of, of, of programming. Uh, and, and, and those, those students who constitute the bulk of the students in the course have one set of experiences. At the other extreme, you have students that are admitted to Georgia Tech. So these 4,000 students that I talked about are students that have been put through a rigorous admissions process. Uh, and, and, and they are admitted as master's students at, at Georgia Tech. They are, they are every bit as qualified as the, as the, as the residential students to follow these, um, follow these, these courses. Uh, there are students that we would not have been able to admit for capacity reasons, not for quality uh, reasons. So, so at this other extreme, you have students that look very much in terms of, of their expectation from the program, like our traditional, traditional students. In the middle, you have, you have varying uh, experiences for the students. So for example, um, one kind of student um, comes to the master's degree um, without being admitted to Georgia Tech, uh, but taking two courses and an exam, which they can then present as a credential for admission. So this would be someone who's maybe been out of school for a long time uh, and, uh, and, and doesn't really have the, the credentials to be admitted directly into the master's program, but we allow them to take uh, uh, two courses from the curriculum, take an exam, and then that gets bundled together with their admissions package and they're they're using that to to um, to be admitted to the 
to the program. That's still another experience that the, that the students have. The one constant through all of this uh, is, is, that, is that the students in the online program are very vocal. Uh, we, we, we've, we've set up uh, Google Plus groups um, for these students. The students um, divide themselves according to interest and geography and age and expect, expectations. And I spend a lot of time sifting through the online comments of these, um, of these, these students. And, and, and they all experience something very, very different than our residential students. They're experiencing not only the, the, the kind of absorption process of learning the material, they're experiencing a different kind of social interaction, maybe something that's uniquely millennial, maybe something that, that, that you know, we, we are going to see sweep through the rest of our, our student bodies. But, but they're used to talking to each other uh, uh, in, um, in online uh, and social networks in ways that, that we weren't when I was a, when I was a student. And, and that's an overlay to, to, um, to all of this. So, so I, I think the, the, the prestige aspect, I think, comes through in, in different ways for different students. The students who are admitted to the program, you can tell they kind of puff themselves up as the, uh, uh, as the admissions process goes, goes forward, and they're, they're very proud of it. But, but in the class itself, it's really kind of hard to tell. Uh, and and, and it's, it's really the interactions between the students that matter a lot. So maybe there's a shift taking, um, taking place there. We think, we think the quality of this program does not have to do with exclusion. It has to do with the inherent quality of the coursework and, and what the students learn at the end of the day. Hello, I'm, I'm Claudio, I'm economics professor here at EHL. Um, just a quick question. We talked about you know, teaching, um, conveying information to students. You didn't talk much about um, assessment. Uh, I think that probably the way you assess students also dramatically changed. And what do you suggest if we want to embark on MOOC and digital learning? What uh, advice could you give us? Well, it all starts with assessment. And, and th th thanks for bringing, for bringing that, that, that up. Um, as, as we coach professors um, to, to redesign their, their courses, assessment plays a critical, a critical role. Um, the desire is, is that every one of our courses follows an active learning, a mastery learning uh, uh, format so that, 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 that formative assessment is built into the, the class itself. Uh, we're getting better all the time at, at observing how the students are learning the material and, and, and changing what we, what we um, present to them uh, as, a, as a result. Um, there's, just like, just like in Europe, there, there's a heavy emphasis uh, here on, on, on summative assessments, on, on, on exams at the end of the, uh, end of the process, which, which turn out to be not very predictive of, uh, of future success. So, so we're, we're trying to use the technology to bring the best in assessment techniques uh, into, um, into play. For some of our, some of our fields, uh, particularly engineering fields, uh, it's probably a little easier to, to do that because, because there's a, a piece of code that you can write, there's an equation that you can, um, that you can solve, uh, and, and we're clearly leveraging, um, leveraging that. But, but we, have, we have courses in, uh, one of our most popular courses uh, is, um, is in um, uh, is in English for non for non English is designed for non English speaking uh, uh, students. It's a, the title of the course is how to write an effective email in English. So we know how to market this to be um, to be a, attractive to, to students. But but there is an example of, of of how you actually have to look at the writing that takes place and and, and make assessments for it. And to do that at scale, you need some you need some uh, some technology. Um, the other thing I'll, I'll mention, and, and this is a little farther out, um, we've had some great initial successes in applying artificial intelligence uh, to, um, uh, to give feedback uh, to, to students, uh, and, and that's received some press. We have some research around that that, that I think is, um, is pretty compelling. You know, a lot of what a student is looking for by way of assessment is simply feedback, uh, and, and, and to the extent that you can give timely feedback. And in fact, the meta-studies in, in education research, uh, I think, um, uh, deliberately confuse the, 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 the personal feedback that a professor gives 
with the timeliness of feedback that you would get from the technology. The only thing that we know for sure is that timely feedback affects learning, um, learning outcomes. So to the extent that our, our assessment methodologies are really aimed at providing that timely information back to the student, I think we're going to be relatively well advantaged. So just again, thanks very much, Richard. Thank you.